Well, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction. And uh, yes, yes, it is the case that, albeit for a rather brief period, I, I was science minister in between what have now been these two spells as um, Minister of State for Energy. And um, in, in case anyone here has ever wondered how you be become a new minister or a minister in a new portfolio, I I'll tell you the story that I, there I was as energy minister at a meeting in Brussels coming back on Eurostar um, after quite a, quite a long and arduous meeting and um, feeling a bit tired on the, on the, on the train. I, I, I left my mobile phone on Eurostar and a wonderful attendant, as I found out later, called Nadia, rushed down the platform with my mobile phone trying to catch me, but I, I was off in the, in the car, the hybrid Toyota Prius, I, I had, <laughs> um, not the Jaguar that some of my colleagues favor. Um, and uh, Nadia was left with the ministerial phone when it rings, and, they, and the, the number 10 operator said, number 10 Downing Street, the prime minister would like to talk to you. <laughs> um, so Nadia almost became the science minister. And, <laughs> As um, a social scientist, because that's what I am, I, I've always been concerned about the, the gender inequalities in the energy and science fields. And I think it'd been rather good if Nadia had become the science minister, but it, 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 it fell to me. Um, but then Gordon Brown asked me to come back to uh, the energy sector. And of course, both are, are pretty vital in terms of these issues about climate change. Um, your program is about the big challenges of the 21st century, as I understand it. And certainly I, I think that some of these big challenges um, relate to our subject for discussion tonight. Because my guess would be that when the historian looks back on the 21st century, certainly among the six or seven big themes that she or he tries to um, summarize a whole century uh, with, I think certainly energy security and certainly climate change will be there. But I, for our discussion, would also briefly raise another important theme, which is about social justice when it comes to climate and energy. Certainly in many of the decisions we make now in these areas will have implications for the next 50 years at least. And, and although one becomes tired of people reminding you of what Harold Wilson once said about a week being a long time in politics. And I, and I know what he meant, and we've had a few of those weeks actually recently. Um, nevertheless, I'm struck as energy minister that the decisions we are wrestling with about nuclear energy, about carbon emissions, show that actually half a century is not a, a, not a very long time when it comes to some of these challenges that we now face. Um, climate change is the global problem um, par excellence uh, clearly requiring, by definition, international solutions. But it goes hand in hand with the geopolitics of energy supply and demand, which have emerged for governments around the world as a crucial factor in what we might term a nation's peace of mind. In other words, an aspect of the nation's security. And it's therefore no coincidence that this featured prominently in the national security strategy published by our Prime Minister earlier this month. With such powerful forces at play, it's important that we do remember uh, the weak and the meek. The energy revolution of the 21st century must not be allowed to create a new underclass of energy poor. Either people, often the most elderly in our own society, who could become priced out of the precious warmth that they need to survive, or in developing nations having, in order to compete, to accept high levels of pollution or to replace the food crops they need with biomass for export to the richer parts of the world. On climate change, we are fortunate, I believe, in this country that there is no longer any serious scientific argument about the fundamentals of climate change. And I think we are fortunate. Um, that is not the case, say, in the United States, although I think many of us are hopeful that things are improving there. The scientific evidence is, after all, overwhelming. As, as you, sir, were saying in, in the introduction, the climate is changing and we have to act. We know that the effects of global warming become extremely severe when a temperature rise of over two degrees Celsius occurs and that much of the world faces a rise of over four degrees if we fail to act. We also know that carbon dioxide emissions are largely to blame, 
and that fossil fuels used in energy production, including heat, including transportation, are responsible for the majority of those carbon dioxide emissions. Now, the latest World Energy Outlook report from the International Energy Agency predicts that under current policies and trends, global carbon dioxide emissions will rise nearly 60% by 2030. Sir Nicholas Stern's report pointed very clearly to the economic imperatives of addressing climate change quickly, showing how the cost rises exponentially if we wait too long, with the risk of wiping at least 5% from global GDP each year in the future if we do not act. And the seriousness of the ecological situation was brought home to me personally when I had the great opportunity of visiting in situ the British Antarctic Survey team in Rothera. This is, of course, where British scientists first discovered the hole in our ozone layer. The young researchers there, men and women, undertake vital work on ice cores, for example, which document the impact of fossil fuels on our climate. I was struck by their very real concern, both as scientists, but equally as citizens, about the dramatic changes that they're witnessing, not least in terms of sea levels. The IPCC calculate that the global average sea level has risen since 1961 at an average rate of 1.8 kilometers per year, and since 1993 at 3.1 millimeters per year, with contributions from thermal expansion, melting glaciers, and ice caps and the polar ice sheets. Of course, it's always likely to be the poor who are the most at risk in the world. For example, projections show that long-term sea, sea level rise in the 21st century could displace about 17 million people in Bangladesh, one of the world's poorest countries, of course. Let me say something about energy security. The finite nature of the planet's reserves of fossil fuels um, are very apparent and high energy prices are no surprise when global demand is also rising dramatically, not least as a result of the economic success now of China and India, but also other emerging economies. The World Energy Outlook predicts under current policies that the world's energy needs will grow by 55% between 2005 and 2030, with fossil fuels accounting for 84% of this. Developing countries contribute 74% of this global increase. China and India alone account for 45% of it. Here, stocks of oil and gas in the UK continental shelf are declining, currently at about 8% per year. Having enjoyed a period of being a net exporter of oil and gas, the UK is now having to import some of its energy. And by 2020, we will be importing the majority of our gas somewhere between 50 or 60 percent, maybe as much as 80 percent. With around half the world's coal reserves in the US, Russia and China, with big gas reserves in the Middle East and Russia, and with oil overwhelmingly concentrated in the Middle East, it's clear that we need to avoid over-dependence on any one region of the world for our supplies. So faced with these twin challenges of climate change and energy security, it's clear that we must move as quickly as possible towards being a successful low carbon economy. This means cutting our carbon emissions dramatically while still powering our economy and taking action now to ensure that secure energy supplies we've enjoyed in the last 50 years are replaced by new but equally secure supplies over the next 50 years. So we are the first government in the world to impose a binding target for reducing CO2 emissions on ourselves We've committed to a 60% reduction in CO2 by 2050, against where we were in 1990, incidentally. And we will consider tightening the target up to 80% if we are so advised. The EU emissions trading scheme is vital as we work to meet that binding target. It puts a price on carbon, giving industry both an incentive and a mechanism to cut its emissions in the most cost-effective way. And we are working to reform the scheme to make it more effective and to bring an aviation and carbon capture um, program into the ETS in the future. London is already a leading centre for carbon trading. As usual, there are economic opportunities as well as costs in tackling climate change. 
and the global carbon market that we want to see in the longer term will help to extend clean technologies to the developing world. Energy efficiency is vital here, and it should be the first part of any strategy. What may seem small things, insulating our homes better so they're cheaper to heat, replacing light bulbs with energy efficiency ones, and even just turning the TV off rather than leaving it on the famous standby can make a big difference. But energy still needs to be generated, of course. So we need to bring on low carbon sources such as renewables and nuclear. We have huge momentum in renewables now. This year we expect to become the world's leading country in terms of installed offshore wind capacity. And we are studying the feasibility of harnessing the tidal power of the River Severn, whose estuary has the second largest tidal range in the world, capable, some estimate, of meeting 5% of our country's electricity needs. And while we continue to move forward very rapidly with renewable deployment, this summer we will be consulting on our strategy to make the further step change we need in order to meet our share of the European Union's target that 20% of all energy, not just electricity, all energy should come from renewables by 2020. Nuclear power is a low carbon energy source and we have asked energy companies to come forward with proposals for new nuclear power stations as the current ones near closure. Companies will have to provide upfront for their waste management and decommissioning costs, meaning that new nuclear power stations will not be subsidized at all by the taxpayer. But we also have to be realistic and recognize that we will still be burning fossil fuels for decades to come. And so more importantly, much more importantly, will countries like China, countries like India. We're therefore leading the way in the search for technological solutions that will make these fossil fuels cleaner. We're supporting the world's first commercial scale demonstration project for, for post-combustion carbon capture and storage on a coal-fired plant. This technology has the potential to capture 90% of carbon emissions and is a crucial tool in the global fight against climate change. Our approach remains a market-based one because we know that markets produce efficient outcomes. But intervention is sometimes needed to ensure that the vulnerable do not suffer at the hands of the market. Fuel poverty in the United Kingdom reduced year on year since 1997 until about last year, when the increase in global energy prices started to reverse some of our good work in this area. That's why we're now working harder than ever to address the problem. And of course, it's why the Chancellor's announcement in the budget of a substantial increase in winter fuel payments for the elderly was so very welcome. I, I'd like to finish by saying something about the citizen. Often energy security and global warming is discussed in terms of large institutions, big countries, the European Union, the G8, the UN, uh, what big institutions uh, can do. I believe, however, that the 21st century uh, will not be an age of state control. It will be an age in our democracies of the informed citizen, empowered like never before by knowledge and by technology, an age of choice. So I hope people will play an active and informed part in, in politics and public affairs, applying pressure to local and national governments to force us to make the right choices for our planet. I hope we will take personal action, for example, by recycling as much of our waste as possible, by choosing low carbon products as consumers, by improving the thermal efficiency of our dwellings, and by taking care with our modes of transport. And finally, I hope people will be prepared to make mature judgments about energy infrastructure projects, or at least to accept that government has to. Green pressure groups sometimes suggest that renewable and new renewables and energy efficiency alone can provide a complete solution perhaps together with a woolly hat and a jumper. That's simply not realistic. It's not serious dialogue. Meanwhile, even those renewable projects are often controversial, and many people are happy to support the principle, but fail to support the example by supporting wind farm projects and the rest near their village. I believe we can meet the great challenges of energy security and climate change in this, the 21st century, and in a way that allows for social justice, but it will require a mature approach, and that means citizens sometimes saying yes to in, in, energy infrastructure, and not always being overwhelmingly ready to sign the petition that says no. 
With that mature approach, we have a unique opportunity, I believe, Chairman, to set a positive direction for the coming decades. I believe that that's what we're doing. I'm anxious to hear Lord Brown's view and then to take part in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.